Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Maria Pio, and I am the co-director at the Godwin Turnback Museum at Queens College, where I oversee administration and education programs such as this one. Uh, my co-director, Louise Weinberg, who curated the exhibition, Human Nature, Portraits from the Permanent Collection, is also joining us this evening, as is Stephanie Lee, our museum assistant. I know that, you know, given the circumstances, we can't all be in the museum this evening, uh, but I'm so happy to see so many of you here virtually in this space. Um, if you have not had a chance after the program, I invite you to view our virtual exhibition on our website at www.gtmuseum.org. Uh, and there you will also find information about upcoming programs that we have coming up. I wanna take a moment to thank our donors and funders, including the Friends of the Godwin Turnback Museum, the Avery Arts Foundation, the Matisse Foundation, Kofferberg Center for the Arts and Queens College. Without their support, we would not be able to bring this program to you all today. Lastly, given that we're all together in this virtual space, I just wanna go over a few reminders for our virtual program this evening. Uh, please remember to mute when you are not speaking, and this will help uh, reduce the um, background noises that we may have. Uh, you can use the chat function to submit any questions or comments throughout the presentation, and we will also have a short Q&A session right after Gina's presentation. Please remain courteous and respectful, and hateful language of any kind will not be tolerated. This evening, I am so excited and happy to welcome Queens College photography professor and artist Gina Minnelli to give this talk. And I wanna do a quick introduction to Gina. So Gina Minnelli is a Queens-based photographer with an MFA from Queens College and a BFA from the School of Visual Arts. Um, Gina is currently teaching photography as an adjunct assistant professor at Queens College and Malloy College. Upon graduation, she was the chief photographer of the New York Mets baseball team, later became the first assistant to internationally renowned environmental portrait photographer Arnold Newman. She photographed and co-produced the book Incidental Heroes, showcasing black and white portraits and biographies of inspirational people who are living successful lives with multiple sclerosis. With over 250,000 copies in print, Incidental Heroes was covered by Photo District News, NBC News, Lifetime Television, Self Magazine, We Magazine, and the New York Daily News. In 2020, Professor Minnelli was featured on PBS for her photography portrait series on the religious diversity and flushing with ceramicist Nancy Bruno. Entitled, and this was entitled The Beacon of Pluralism. She was a presenter at the College Art Association Annual Conference in Chicago, where her and her colleague Jenny LaMonica led a discussion on mindfulness and con contemplative pedagogy in the classroom. So it is such an honor um, to introduce, and please let us all give a warm welcome to Gina Minnelli. So take it away, Gina. Okay. Thank everybody so much for your patience, number one, and for joining us tonight. I really appreciate the Godwin Turnbach Museum for allowing me to do this talk in Queens College. And I also most importantly want to thank my family and my friends and my colleagues and my students for watching. Okay, especially my students. I'm looking at you right now. Okay, you know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> So tonight I want to talk about portrait photography because that's what this exhibit at the Godwin Turnbach Museum is about. And for me, uh, portrait photography started when um, I was 12 years old. Okay, I know it's ridiculous. So these, this is a portrait of my parents and I shot it with a four by five camera. That means four inches by five inches is the negative um, because I have to keep on educating. Um, and uh, this is in our backyard. And my parents were both born in Italy and they came here as teens. And they- oh, sorry, 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 you're not sharing. This is not sharing. It's not sharing? No. We can okay. see it. What are you seeing? We see you. Oh my God, you don't want to see me? Okay. We do, we do, you're so funny. <laughs> 
that fun. You're so funny. Okay, so now, Spencer, now I was able to see it. Yeah, I we can, I could see it on my end. Now it's working. Now okay, it's working. Excellent. Can every all right? Great. Adva's my girl. She tells me <laughs> the truth all the time. Okay, so this is a picture of my family. Uh, my parents, and this is in our backyard in Queens. And um, so, as I said, my parents came from a different country and they came here and they allowed me to follow my interest in photography, even though it was so different from any path that they took. My dad was a machinist and my mom a homemaker. And when I was 12, I started to become interested in photography. And I, I really like gravitated towards holding a camera to me holding a camera was like um like a superhero cape that you put on because i felt like i was a different person when i had a camera like i was able to approach others and talk to them because i felt less shy because i had a camera so it was like an excuse like i'm photographing you because i have a camera and i'm talking to you because i have a camera and it was like like this crutch that I used. I know it was like a, a, I know my daughter studied psychology. I know I was using it as a crutch, but it was my way of getting to know people. So by the time I was in the eighth grade, I had my dad close off this small section in our basement and build a dark room. And my parents were fine. They were like fine with everything, even like taking away part of their basement. But their only caveat was that whatever I do, I had to fund it myself and pay for it myself. And that's like a very much of a uh, an immigrant upbringing where, you know, you pull yourself up from your bootstraps and you do it yourself. So I started working at a very young age, not as young as my sister. My older sister started working even younger than me, but I started working at a very young age. And by the time I was in high school, I had at least two jobs, depending on what kind of photography equipment I wanted to buy, I would add an extra job. So, okay, let me go to the next slide. Why baseball? Okay. So one, I am starting with the first photo series I ever did. And, and it's, and I've done a lot of them, but the first photo series I ever did was about baseball. And one of the reasons why I did baseball, because I'm not a baseball person. I'm like, not, I'm, I'm into art. And, um, but one of my first jobs or one of my many first jobs was working in the concession stand at Shea Stadium. It was me, it was like a bunch of friends, it was all of my cousins, we worked the games. But one of the things that we had to do when we worked at Shea Stadium is that we had to show up like three hours before the game actually started because we had to set up our, our stand, our booth of like hot dogs and food. And I was lucky enough to serve soft serve ice cream and helmets, you know, it's very exciting. Um, but once we got our stand set up, then we could go and like sit in the stands and watch the game or watch like batting practice. So for me, I didn't care about the baseball players. I wanted to watch the actual professional photographers do their thing. That was what I was interested in. So this is, this is what I saw. Okay. OMG. Okay, it was so stiff and posed. It was like very uninspired. No offense to anybody that does baseball card photography, but it wasn't my thing. Like I liked experimentation. I liked like going out of the box. So in the off season, again, I'm in, I'm in high school about to start college. And in the off season, I'm like, I am going to get on that field. I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to get on that field. Well, I did care what I have to do, but I mean, I, I was, I, I was going to really, really try. So I did, I made a lot of phone calls. I made, I was so annoying. Um, all right. We might use the word tenacious to getting where I wanted to go. And I, I, I did work it out that I became an intern at the ballpark. Now I wasn't in the inter, I wasn't an intern in the photography area because they didn't need anybody. So I got, <laughs> um, I got a job logging video, uh, logging the games 
as they happened. Okay, so what did that mean? I had a clipboard and I would write, oh, at 237.07, a hit was made and, and write the information down. That was my internship. It was like the most boring thing in the world. So for like a billion times, I asked my bosses, can I please go on the field? Can I please go on the field pregame? Can I please go on the field pregame? And I just kept on asking. Again, tenacity, just kept on doing it. So finally, this is like months into the season after I'm logging all of these games. I think we had 80 home games. I'm logging all of these games. Um, they got me a press pass just to shut me up. And I was able to go down onto the field and shoot. And, and it was so awesome. So suddenly now a year later, I'm on the field with these same photographers that were so boring. And here I am, first of all, I'm female. I forgot to mention that um, in the sports world, there weren't that many female photographers. Um, and also I was very young. So people didn't really take me seriously, which I used as, as an advantage because everybody underestimated me. They didn't know that I had been studying photography from at that point for like eight years already. So I kind of, I'm not going to say I knew what I was doing, but I kind of knew what I was doing. Um, so I got to go down a few times during that season and photograph and uh, show my bosses my work, which was great. So <laughs> then uh, I, the season was done. I'm back at college. Everything is normal. Everything is fine. I did my internship. Okay. I tried. I got on the field, whatever. And then all of a sudden, right before spring training of the following year, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. And circumstances had it that the Mets needed a new team photographer. And it was right before spring training. They were frantic trying to find somebody. And oh my God, what about that intern that shot those pictures? So all of a sudden, this happened. Like, what the heck? Are you kidding me? Um, so they give me the phone call. They call me and they're like, are you interested in being the new team photographer for the New York Mets? And, and again, I'm in college. So I'm just like, um, yeah, okay. As long as I could work it into my schedule. Yeah. Um, which was ridiculous because of course I was going to do it because most of the games are over the summer when I don't have school. So it was fine. So um <laughs> It's like, it's so ridiculous. Um, so anyway, I became the team photographer. The first thing I had to do was fly on an airplane and go to spring training. I have never gone on an airplane without my parents. And I was like having a heart attack, but I figured it out. I packed up my gear. I went to Florida and the season began. So I'm going to show you just not that many because I have like 150,000 pictures, but this is what I was doing now. This, these are a couple of pictures of Lenny Dykstra, who was on the team at the time. And everybody else is shooting with 35 millimeter cameras. Okay, guys, so this is before digital. So this is film. And everybody's shooting with 35 millimeter. So me being the person that I am, I shoot with a 120 camera. So this is my baby. This is the actual camera that I shot this picture of Lenny Dykstra um, with. This is called the Pentax 6.7. I've had it forever and I still shoot with it. So I was shooting and it's really heavy and it's really big. And I'm again, female, not I, oh, I'm an also five foot two. Okay, so I'm small and I have this big heavy camera. All the photographers are looking at me laughing like, what is she doing? But I actually was doing something very specific. You know, the, the term like keep your eye on the ball with an, a big negative, like a six, seven, a six centimeters by seven centimeters. That's what they're talking about. 35 millimeters is a negative. That's 35 millimeters. This is where it's coming from. So look at the way you can see his eyes looking at the ball. Okay. I'm at a very high shutter speed. So that's why the ball is able to be frozen in that moment. Uh, and you see his eyes exactly on the ball. So I was trying to basically my whole time, I wasn't a team photographer very long, but while I was, I just tried to experiment and express my own point of view, which I felt was lacking in the sports field at the time. 
So this is another one. The manager at the time was Davey Johnson. And I love this picture in batting practice where he's teaching Gary Car Carter how to hold the bat properly to get a better swing. And if anybody knows Gary Carter, he, um, you know, he was like a Hall of Fame player. Um, so I think it's very adorable that he's showing him what to do. Um, this is uh, an interesting photograph because um, up until, I don't know, five days ago, Fred Wilpon was the owner of the New York Mets. And here he is talking to Davey Johnson about what to do with the players on the field. And uh, what I did was I got low to the ground so that my point of view made them look larger than life and giving, giving them a perspective of being important. So I, I combine these two photographs together because if anybody watches baseball, um, this is baseball, okay? This is Lee Mazzilli. Uh, again, shot with this camera that I'm holding right here um, in the outfield. Baseball is either super boring where you're just standing there. I mean, he actually has his hand up to his mouth because he's so bored. He's just standing there. Shot that with the Pentax 6-7. Or it's the opposite where action happens very quickly. In the days that I was the photographer, we didn't have automatic focus on our cameras. I'm very old. And we had to know by feel, well, I used one of those big lenses. This is when I'm shooting sports. I had to use a, a, a 35 millimeter lens with a 300 millimeter lens that had a 2.8 opening so that you could get a, a lot of light coming into the lens. So the action happened really, really fast. And what I would learn automatically was if I moved the le if I moved the focus like a quarter of an inch, I got to first base. If I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the photo booth, uh, the photo box right on the field. If I move it like three quarters of an inch, then I'm on second base. And I, I like suddenly you start be get this muscle memory of how to focus your lens because again, things are happening super fast. And that's the way it was. So this next photograph is me having fun because my whole point and my whole approach to portrait photography is getting to know the people. I didn't care that they were baseball players because it, like, who cares? Like we all have our own thing that we do in our life. There, there's just happening to be baseball players. This is Rafael Santana, who's like looking all cool and groovy, but he doesn't know that the coach Sam Palazzo is behind him giving him bunny ears, which we've all done. We've all done when somebody like is thinking like they're too cool. Um, but it's just funny to see it in baseball. Um, I was in the in the dugout having a conversation with Dwight Gooden one day. Um, and he was trying to get me to give give me his cam uh, give him my camera, and I'm like, no, I'm not giving you my camera. I'm like, you make more in a game that you're not playing than I make in a year. I'm like, I'm not giving you my camera. Get out of here. Um, so we were laughing about it, and then I just lifted up my camera and I took a picture of him um, laughing at me because I wouldn't give him what he wanted. Not gonna happen. Um, so they made me shoot sports. I had to shoot sports because we had a yearbook, we had a calendar, we had all of this stuff. So I did shoot sports. Um, this is one of Dwight Gooden. Um, I played around with like long shutter speeds just to make it interesting because I get bored very easily. And um, I played around a lot. Uh, while I was shooting. This is a uh, gentleman, Kevin Elster. Again, like what I was talking about, it's really boring when you're not playing the game. You just sit and you wait. Um, so this is Kevin Elster, just kind of like watching batting practice and what's going on. Uh, this is Buddy Harrelson. And I love that he's wearing two hats um, because he was a, a baseball player for the New York Mets. And then he became a coach for the New York Mets. So, you know, we just had a lot of fun. And again, because I was young, like nobody really noticed that I was there. And, and it was great. Um, so this picture I included of Keith Hernandez because this was my first published picture. And any photographer out there knows how important it is for your first picture. It's like, yay. So, and, and then to top it off, again, showing my age, it was in the TV guide. 
everybody in America got the TV guide. Like the TV guide was like the, the like the pinnacle of everybody getting it. So um, this picture, when it was in TV guide, I was like, oh my God, I made it. It was like, oh, it, I told me and my cousin, that was like pretty much it. Um, but it was in the TV guide and, and I just felt like I was, I was like the cat's meow, like that was awesome. Um, and really it's just like an okay picture, but they needed a picture. So, um, uh, shooting for them meant shooting in pouring rain, not fun. Um, it was, uh, you know, there were, there were bad parts to it as well, especially if I had to like go to school the next day. Um, one of the fun things that I did, I did a lot of fun things, but one of them was that, okay, so my cell phone, I don't have my cell phone with me, but on your cell phone, you know how you have the panoramic mode in, in, like everybody has panorama, like that's like a normal thing. Okay, in my day, 150 years ago, there was no panorama. It was just the frame in your camera lens. So I rented a panoramic camera. That was actually a thing. You could rent a panoramic camera. And so the negative is six centimeters by 17 centimeters centimeters okay so it was huge the cat so you know whereas like people thought I was ridiculous showing up with this camera uh which is like ridiculous for sports I showed up with this big huge panoramic camera one day and but the reason that I did it was because I was amazed again not like a baseball person I would, this is Dwight Gooden and this is Mel Stottlemyre over here. And I, this is the bullpen. This is where they would practice and warm up and things like that. And what I was amazed at was the distance that say Dwight Gooden, for example, would throw to get the ball to Mel Stottlemyre's mitt. And anybody who's a baseball fan knows, like they do like sinkers right at the last second. They do all of this magical stuff. And I was amazed at the distance that they had to travel to get to that point. I mean, it was like really incredible. So that's why I rented the camera. So this is another behind the scenes, also in the bullpen from a different angle. Um, so here you have like 50,000 plus people in the stands and I would just walk around um, because I would be bored. And um, this is in the bullpen and this is Jeff Innes and he's waiting to be called up to, to pitch. Okay, he's a relief pitcher. He's waiting to go in. He's blowing a bubble. He has his hands in his pockets. He's walking on this little like ramp area. Here are the other guys. They're watching the game on television. They had a little TV in the back of Chase Stadium where they could watch and see what was going on. This is the cart that would bring the players out to the mound when it was their time to pitch. Um, but was so incredible that so few people got to see was that they grew vegetables back there again because there's a lot of downtime okay in baseball so they grew vegetables and I loved that about like that little aspect of like you know growth and nurturing that you would never expect except if you were behind the scenes watching this um here's Ron Darling who's one of the announcers now and pitching and again playing with the shutter speed because I like to have fun um, this is the late Tom Seaver who recently passed away during a, an old timers game and he was awesome. I got to be with him when his number was retired um, at Shea Stadium and I got to be with him the whole day and from the point where they were painting his number 41 on on the outs on the outfield to um, him going around and us celebrating him and then taking photographs with his family. It was just like one of the most special experiences that I had at the ballpark. Um, Okay, so, all right, so here's me just having fun, okay? I played and experimented with a lot of different filters. Um, I experimented with the slow shutter speeds and color. I loved color. Again, this is before digital photography. So when we wanted to enhance our color, we used a different type of film in our camera that was more saturated. 
So I also experimented. Um, everybody who loves baseball is kind of doing this right now. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she did that. All right. So I also experimented with pinhole photography. So pinhole photography is when you have like a box and you literally have like a dot poked into the front and you have a piece of film and you can't see anything. You don't know what you're shooting because there's no lens on the camera. And I just started shooting pinhole photography at the ballpark. Why not? Who's going to stop me? I don't know. Nobody did. So I, I just started shooting pinhole and it was great because there's no lens and, and you never know what you're going to get. Um, with this picture over here, that's the grounds crew. Um, so that's Pete Flynn, who was in charge of the grounds crew for many, many, many years. And um, I, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed to be saying this. And my mother's probably going to be shaking her head. Um, so I took an ashtray from my mom's house and I put the ashtray in front of the lens while I was shooting. And that's how you get all of these like, um, funky lines over here. So I call those modifiers when you put the glass in front of the lens. And, um, and I did it with the grounds crew at, at Shea Stadium. You know, why not? Who's going to stop me? What's happening? They didn't stop me. They actually didn't stop me, uh, which is shocking. Um, so this is later on. I, I wasn't a team photographer forever. Um, so this is later on. I would go to spring training and have fun. And this is Mike Piazza. And, um, you know, anybody, anybody who knows anything about Mike Piazza was that, you know, he was really like a pillar on the team. He wasn't the team captain, but he was a presence on the team. So I love this picture because everybody in the team is looking one way and he's standing by himself alone, kind of doing that, you know, Roman statue kind of uh, pose. And I love how these players are balanced out by these palm trees. And um, I'm just using the grass as this out of focus, like graphic element um, in the photograph. And then this one of Daryl Strawberry, um, I call it the genuflection of, of Daryl Strawberry, um, because to me, sports is very much like a religion where people are very devout to their team, uh, good or bad Mets players. Come on. Um, you know, we, we stick with it no matter what. And I love that he was in this very, this pose of, uh, reverence and all of the fans are watching on. Okay, so here's more of my pinhole photography. Again, I can't see anything. I'm just doing it and I'm having fun. So here they line up the batting helmets before the game so that everybody, and they have like numbers on them. So everybody just like goes over and grabs their number and puts their, their hat on. So this is with the pinhole camera, no lens. Don't know what I'm doing. Um, this one I love that I shot in pinhole because it has like a feeling of nostalgia about it. You know, like it could have been shot a hundred years ago, even though it was shot, I'm not going to say, but like in like the nineties, I'm going to say in the eighties, nineties um, area. But I like that it gives that vintage look. Um, here are just a couple of pictures of them like preparing for, you know, stretching, working out kind of thing. Um, and I also photographed other things like I photographed, um, you know, the children and, and their reaction to baseball. They're like looking up at the players as being these like wonderful heroes. Uh, again, this is me just walking around the ballpark, um, just trying to take photographs from kind of like an interesting point of view from my point of view that I felt like people hadn't seen before. Um, one of my favorite parts of going to a ballpark and go or a stadium or anything that has like this big crowd. And, and I call it the Frank Lloyd Wright effect where you're like walking through someplace narrow and then all of a sudden the expanse just opens. And that's what I was trying to do over here. Um, all of a sudden this dad and the son came in and they walked and they just paused and they just looked around. And I was like, oh, Thank you. That's my shot. That's my shot. I've been trying to get that shot. Um, 
hear some more of spring training of everybody, you know, just kind of like making it a little bit alternative than what you normally would see. I pretty much cut everybody's heads off, but. Uh, and then some of the behind the scenes, getting ready for the game to start. I love the people that worked at the ballpark. Um, they uh, often had worked there for many decades and it was like this family. And, and I just love talking to everybody and just seeing what went on uh, behind the scenes. So then all of a sudden they tearing down my ballpark. Um, so if anybody is familiar with City Field, if you've been to City Field, this is what it looked like when they were building it. Um, if you recognize right here, this is the Shea Bridge, which is one of the icons at City Field that you walk over. Here it's on the ground. They haven't, hadn't yet installed it. Um, and it was like a really like um, sad moment for me because of uh, you know all of my memories and being a team photographer were held at Shea Stadium. Um, this next picture is a picture of Shea Stadium in its glory and city field being built. And, and it was just kind of like that passing of the baton of the old and the new. So this is my last shot of Shea Stadium, which was very sad. Um, and then they tore it down. <laughs> and it was just so sad for me because I had so many memories. It, it offered me so many opportunities. Um, and, and it, it was sorely missed. By the way, I do love City Field. It's awesome. Um, so one of my favorite parts of photographing baseball, which I've done for years, is photo day. Now, photo day is a day at spring training where all of a sudden, all of the baseball players, they come in with their cute little signs with their names on them, and you get to photograph them. So because I worked for the team, I would often get a room to photograph them. Sometimes the rooms were big. Sometimes they were um, bathrooms, like literally a bathroom. Um, it depended on the year that I photographed them. But um, I loved it. I would bring my lights down, bring my equipment, and kind of like have an idea in mind about what I wanted to do. And every time I went, which was not every year, it was it was maybe like a few times a decade, I'm going to say. Um, like, I just loved it because in like a two hour window, I got to photograph about 80 people and I would have just a few minutes to gain a rapport, learn who they are if I didn't know them, and then create a portrait of their essence. Okay, that's like sounds ridiculous, but that's what would happen. It was like speed dating, okay? It was like speed dating and photography. So here is me set up, ready to go. I, I would always lay everything out like very clearly where they should go just to cut down on talking time. So uh, I'm just gonna scroll through some pictures through the years uh, that I took during this like three minutes what do they, what do they say? Five minutes in heaven, three minutes, in heaven, whatever it was. Um, but that was like what this was. I, I had enough time to like crack a joke to make Mookie Wilson laugh. Okay. Um, and I just had to keep them rolling. They were just rolling. And, and, you know, it depended like this one of Wally Whitehurst, he's much more serious in the photograph. Um, Mike Piazza, very serious at this time. This was the height of um, probably in the late 1990s where he was like super popular. Everybody was pulling him in different directions and he was like not having it. So what did I do? Because he was not having it. I slowed my pace down and I went over and I, st I went over and I start positioning his arms. I'm like, no, I want you to stand this way. I want you to stand this way because I knew he wanted to leave. So I was just like, um, because I wanted to, I, I, I wanted to evoke an emotion out of him. And that's what I got, you know, this seriousness of him wanting to literally kill me um, because he wanted to leave. You know, here's Al Leiter. He was much more lighthearted about it. You know, he was laughing. He was having a good time because he didn't have the pressure that Mike Piazza had on him. Um, this is another year, again, changing it up, shooting in black and white, um, being more dramatic with my lighting. Anytime I got new equipment and I could test it out, I'm like, hey, I'm going to do it at spring training. That'll be fun. 
but this is, uh, you know, just trying to play around, just trying to evoke emotion out of people in a very short time and um, do something different. So the, all of the ones with the brown backdrop um, were done at one year. So uh, recently, probably a few years ago, um, maybe like three years ago, I had this idea and I was like, I'm going to shoot the baseball players like clip art. You know, clip art, it's like that super cheap, like, you know, you get it for free uh, um, of like, uh, like outlines, silhouettes of people. And I, and I'm trying to explain to Noah Syndergaard about clip art here in this picture. I'm like, you know what it's like, you know, like he's taking an art class. Um, so here I am trying to explain to him what I wanted him to do. And um, this is kind of like what it turned out to be. It turned out to be like, I said, how would you be during the game? Like, what would your pose be during the game? And, and then I made these like clip art photographs of the ball players. Again, I was just experimenting. I was having fun. And, and I use that, that fun word a lot when I'm teaching because I really, really, really believe that photography is so much fun. A, you know, just again, each year I just try to evoke different things out of different people. So, so this is another year that I'm photographing. I had two setups this year because I wanted to use shoot with a ring light. And I also had like regular studio lights set up. So here's Jacob deGrom sitting here and I'm trying to photograph David Wright. And Jacob deGrom wouldn't stop heckling David Wright while I'm photographing. And because if anybody has ever met Jacob deGrom, he likes to joke around. And, um, and if you see here, I make it very easy. I draw arrows where they need to walk. I'm like, okay, just follow the arrows. So, I don't, so it eliminates me talking. And then I get to spend more time actually conversing with them one-on-one. -on -one. So um, in that same seat that Jacob deGrom is sitting in, this is me photographing my piazza. Um, and you could see kind of my lighting set up, the ring light, and then I have a light projected on the background to light that up. But this is what it looks like in my lens right here. This is what I'm seeing, even though, you know, it looks like I'm like, a, I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. But um, so I'm going to show you some pictures from that series. This is Hansel Robles and he's on the more stu like the studio set. Um, this is uh, the picture of uh, David Wright that he's laughing because of what Jacob Dragram is saying. It's nothing that I'm saying. He's just laughing because he's being heckled at that moment. Um, so uh, this one is uh, Darn uh, Ligaris, Juan Ligaris on, on the light, on the set with the ring light. And, and as, I, as I often say, you could see in their eyeballs what light I use because you could see the circle of light and that's how you can tell what light I used. Um, and so here's Juan Lagaris in, in that set, the ring light set. And here is uh, Brandon Nimmo who, I don't know what I said to him, but he looks like he's about to cry. And I, I, like, I, I have no memory of it. Again, this is like speed dating. Things are happening fast. I probably said something really mean and I don't know. I don't know, but normally he's like very smiley. So it's very unusual, but he's on the other set. Um, of where I'm photographing. So these are all also taken with the ring light. Here's Jacob Tukaram and here's Noah Syndergaard. And again, you know, it's the ring light because you could see the circle in their eyes of what, uh, of how I'm photographing them. So uh, last year I was really honored um, because I got to photograph uh, some of the 1969 Mets players because it was their 50th anniversary. And um, we were in a hotel room um, and there was a video crew set. All right, so we're in a hotel room. There's a video crew set up. As soon as you open up the door to the hotel, the, the room, a video crew was set up and they're interviewing them about, you know, what it was like to play in 1969, blah, blah, blah. And then when you go past the video crew, you get to my setup. And I am in between the bed and the window. 
I probably had, I'm going to say generously, like four feet of space. I have like four feet of space. Plus I have to get somebody, I'm, you know, not to be disrespectful, but let's just say elderly because they were ball players 50 years prior, past all of the equipment of the video crew, past my, my light, my tripod, over and like over the mountains and through the woods to get them to this little bench that I had set up against the wall to photograph them. But that is very much what it's like to shoot on location. You don't know what you're going to walk into. You don't know how much space you're going to have. You pack a ton of equipment, but you end up using just one light because of circumstance. So this is the actual picture that ended up uh, coming out of it. This is Ed Cranepool, and this is before his his uh, organ transplant. Um, so he was not like in the best shape, but he managed to get through all of that equipment and sit down and get photographed, which I was very, very grateful for. Um, here are a couple of more ball, ball players, Ron Swoboda and Cleon Jones. Um, Cleon Jones, it was so amazing. He was like the sweetest human being. Everybody was nice, but I mean, Cleon Jones just like has a warm spot in my heart because when he was telling the story about how he was signed to, to the team, he kept on calling it the New York Metropolitans. And I was like, oh my God, that's like the cutest thing. I'm like, because it was before it was the New York Mets, it was the New York Metropolitans. And, and it was just like really, really great. Um, because of my connection with the Mets, e even though I don't work for them anymore, uh, they have been very, very generous with me. And coming full circle is me going with um, my students to the ballpark. Um, it's like the highlight of, of my class. Um, sorry, guys, that we're in COVID right now. Um, but we, I would get press passes for the students and they would have the same experience that I had at their age. And it was like, you know, just this like wonderful moment where they got to run around and shoot with the press passes on and do whatever they wanted to do. And then the next class, we would go over and have a big display of everybody's photographs and kind of just see what they saw through their eyes. And I was always amazed because it, it was like a learning experience for me because they saw things that I never would have, have seen. And that's what I, I think is so wonderful about this progression that we go through in our lives where we learn. That's the whole point is that we learn. So um, besides like all of this, so I, I'm showing the Mets work because that was my first job. And um, I've had many, many, many photo series in between, but um, my current experience is very special to me. So my current experience, I've decided to, I'm not going to talk about it a lot because it's in the middle of happening. Um, I started about a year ago and then COVID hit. So it's been kind of on hold. Um, you know, while there were indigenous people living in North America long before any immigrants arrived, today the United States is a nation of mostly immigrants. Like so many others, my mother and father came to this country in search of a better life. Wherever they came from, immigrants faced similar challenges. My parents came from Italy at the ages of 18 and 13. They worked very hard to put roots in a new country while preserving their customs and their traditions. So my siblings and I and other children, our first generation Americans, are the product of that tightly woven immigrant heritage and American upbringing. So in this photo series, I explore that. I Now, what I want to say is that this word Italian here happens to be my background, but this word Italian can be substituted for any other um, nationality, any other place of origin, because we are all going through this experience. Again, unless you're Native American, we are all going through this experience of having these customs and these um, a, um, the heritage of our forefathers that we hopefully are embracing and, and, and continuing on in the next generation to come. So I wanted to explore what it was like for other people 
that had their parents born in Italy. And again, I'm just choosing Italy right now uh, for this experience and and what happened to that next generation so these are siblings this is pat and this is bianca and they run their family's gourmet market now i'm gonna say getting pat out of this market was not easy um his family started the market his father worked tirelessly in this market and pat uh took it over and bianca as well and Pat is such a workaholic, again, ingrained in this philosophy of being, uh, um, working hard to achieve what you want in life. And uh, getting him to come out and get this photograph taken was like, come on, Pat, it's time. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And he wouldn't leave, like there was always something else to do and he didn't want to leave. So finally we got him out of the store and we were able to take the photo, or I was able to take the photograph um this is donna and her parents were both born in italy and she's a wine distributor and she and her husband own uh cedar house which is a bed and breakfast on the north fork and i loved photographing her this is the only photograph i took during covid um and i, I loved photographing her in the vineyard which is um the setting for the cedar house um <laughs> so this is Vito and, and I, uh, you know, Vito is a very complex guy. He's a very educated guy, but one of his passions is his cars. He loves cars, restoring cars, and he is a car aficionado besides his regular job. And so he, and, and I hope he's not listening, but I'm going to call this a Ford Mustang. Um, I know it has a much more detailed name than a Ford Mustang, but I love that even though he has this like basic American muscle car in the window, he carries his family's um, symbol and, and like sticker from where he, his family is from in Sicily in the window. Like I love that conflation of being an American, but still carrying on that Italian heritage and pride. And that's what this, you know, this series is about. And again, you could substitute uh, Italians for any country that you're from. It really works. It, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, here is John and Rosalba in there. I'm going to say it's their backyard oasis because they have the outdoor grill over here, uh, the Trinacchia, which is the Sicilian emblem. Um, they also have uh, Rosalba's homemade sauce over here. And these are their children. And these are John's parents who were both born in Italy. And um, their house is just this house of love and laughter. And you just want to spend time with this family. Uh, back at, back at, now we're at City Field. Uh, this is Anthony and he's a video editor and both of his parents were born in Italy. And I love that he's working in video editing um, a, a, for the New York Mets because you can't get more American than baseball. I mean, that's like the, one, two, um, punch up vegan American. So this, this is Anthony uh, at, in the booth. We, it, it's the, what we call the diamond vision booth or the control room where you control everything that goes out onto the scoreboard. And he's an editor over there. So um, I had a great pleasure um, of photographing Peter Vallone Sr. Now, Peter Vallone Sr. was a Democratic New York City councilman from 1974 to 2001, and he became the first speaker of the city council in 1986, and he served until 2002. Um, so every time we would walk down like the hallway or something, everybody would be like, hello, Mr. Speaker, hello, Mr. Speaker, even though he hasn't been the speaker for a while but it's that pride it's that respect that you have and he was the first one um when i was in his office i spent a lot of time with him and when i was in his office i loved that in the background over here he has the ledgers of his family his parents when they came through ellis island and they every when you come through you have to sign um 
that you are um, coming into this country. And he has those framed in his office um, today. And, and I love that he has still brought forth with him his Italian heritage. He's very, very, very involved in, in um, what's going on, not only in, in, in New York, but also with Italian Americans. And um, so, and it's very evident. And, and his father was, even though his father was born in Italy, his father became a judge in New York. And um, one of the biggest things he said to me was that his parents instilled in him inclusion of many different nationalities. And that's what is the basis of our country is that inclusion of all of these immigrants that are coming into this country and that are here, which I think was amazing. Um, so this is Nick and his mom in his mom's backyard with her garden. And um, I will say this, I've never met Nick and his mom before I took this photograph. She welcomed me as soon as I opened up their front door. She had a pot of coffee on the stove and she had a plate of cookies. And all of a sudden I felt like I was at home, even though I never met them before. I felt like, you know, like this connection of tradition. And, um, and it was really, really lovely. Um, this is a, an NYPD uh, police sergeant in the Intelligence Bureau, and he's very high position, and both of his parents were born in Italy. He is, um, you know, the, the first to be educated here in the United States, and he rose to the rank of sergeant, and what I love about his office is that it looks out onto the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island as a reminder of what one generation can do here in America, you know, where his family was here and now he's here um, in the, uh, as a, a New York City police sergeant. So this is Louisa and Louisa is very fashionable and wonderful and I, in my mind, because she's so fashionable and wonderful. I'm like, can you kind of like get like a Sophia Loren vibe uh, for this photograph? And she certainly did. And I love, I love this guy looking up at her. And I was like, yes, um, it's working. Um, Louisa is, uh, and it, she works in a family business and she is an importer of Italian foods. And the reason why we photographed right over here is because right side, outside of this frame is Italy. And that is one of her clients that she uh, distributes her Italian foods to. So, so this is my dentist and uh, Dr. Conti. And I photographed him because we were just having this conversation. I'm like, hey, what are you doing for the holidays? And then he started telling me about all of this stuff. And I'm like, wait a second. I'm like, are you from Italy? And it turns out he's like, yeah, both of my parents are born there. And I'm like, isn't that fantastic? And he said, you know, with the limited education that they had before they came to this country, here he is now a, a doctor of dentistry which I think is fabulous. Um, this is Rose, um, the wonderful Rose in her backyard swimming pool. And uh, Rose spoke to me a lot about growing up and about the hard work, especially that her father had instilled in her and her siblings and the importance of respecting others, not, you know, from many cultures. And um, she also said one of the most important things that her family taught her was how to make sauce which every Italian should know. Um, this is Santino. Um, he runs his family's um, bakery business and it's called Joe Sicilian Bakery. And, and again, all of these like recipes are from his home uh, land and uh, they're very authentic. I think it's like one of the best Sicilian Italian bakeries in New York. It's fantastic. Um, so uh, last but not least, uh, this is Jean. And um, I, I hope she's not listening, but uh, Jean turned 90 this year. 
And um, what I wanted to talk to you about, Jean, is, is again, very reminiscent about what everybody uh, is going through. Um, her father came from Italy and he wanted to be this Italian, this American business owner. And he opened up a bakery in a very small mine, a coal mining town in Pennsylvania. And he would wake up, and if anybody's been in the bakery business, you know it starts very early. Um, he would wake up early, he would put on a suit, and he'd walk the two blocks, like around two blocks to his bakery, take off his suit, and then put on his uh, baking whites, and then get to work all day, and then go back. And at the end of the working a very long day, put his suit back on and walk home because he was a businessman now. He was an American businessman and this country allowed him to be that. And he also instilled um, a very, um, the importance of education in his, with his three children. Uh, Jean went on to become a fourth grade teacher in New Jersey for many years. And her brother was a professor at Duke University. So I just wanted to say, thank you so much for listening to my first experience and my last experience in photography. It, it really, it, it just, thank you very much for your time and your patience. So I'm gonna unshare. Uh, thank you, Gina. Thank you for- Thank you very much. For this. Uh, I know we have lots of questions that have been coming up and comments in the chat. I'm gonna start reading through some of them. If you do have um, a question yourself, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, we are um, running a little over time, but we're gonna I'm take sorry. some time to, uh, no, it's fine, this is great, um, to answer as many questions as we can, comments. Um, so let's start off, let me look through this. Um, we have a question from um, Queens College President Frank Wu, wants oh. to know, <laughs> Um, at the Mets, I think it was during the Mets series. So what f-stop are you using for such sharp images at a distance with action? So probably the one with the, the you can see the, the, the eye and the ball, right? Um, okay. Yeah. So, so I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but there are two things. Okay. So with this camera, I am, I also had what we call a 2X extender on it, which eats up a lot of light, but it was able to, for me to get even further. So I'm at like 2.8 and I had to, again, there's no autofocus. I had to be really careful about my focus. And also um, because it's heavy, it moves a lot. So all of my sports photography is at 2.8 wide open, which is why I had to be super careful about my focus on the lens. Because again, as especially my students know, you go a little bit at, off focus and you lose the sharpness. So I'm at 2.8 uh, for most of these photographs, which is totally wide open because I needed the light, especially during night games. Got it. Thank you. Along those lines, were you using a tripod or a monopod or are you <laughs> hand holding medium format cameras? All right. So uh, I was using a monopod during the games, a tripod never um, because there too, there's too much action going around. And again, everybody or else thought, everybody thought I was nuts with the equipment that I was using again, pinhole camera. Um, so um, I was, I was hand holding everything except for a monopod occasionally. Got it. Um, we have a question from Adva who asks, what lens did you use for the portraits? Probably from the Mets portraits. Uh, for the Mets portraits, I was, I was, uh, it depended, you know, for the ones that I used as uh, like clip art, I used more of a wide angle lens because I had to get the whole, uh, their whole body in. And, you know, Noah Syndergaard is very tall. Um, so you, I, again, if I'm in a bathroom and I'm photographing them, I don't have a lot of space. So I would carry a bunch of lenses with me and I would choose the lens depending on the space. But for the portraits, I would maybe like a 90 millimeter lens, you know, just to get more of a close up of their face. Got it. That's great. Thank you. Um, looking through some of these questions, let's see if there's anyone. Um, I think they found a market that you photographed uh, one of your, the first photographs of your, in your 2020 series. I think um, people spotted it as being in Bayside. So yes, um, it is. And, and I highly recommend uh, Bayside Milk Farm. They have wonderful, authentic <laughs> Italian foods as well as uh, international foods as well. Great. Um, I think there's a comment here from Anna Adler who asks, 
Um, I think it, it, this is again on your immigration series. These are pretty. These are pretty specific versions of the American immigrant identity because um, you do mention it's of um, uh, Italian descent. So I guess my follow up question to that would be: How do you think? Um, you know, because you are photographing based on your own sort of nationality, where your parents came from. Um, what do you think this, you know, is, is there, have you thought about maybe uh, looking or, or partnering with other photographers that may be able to capture um, different nationalities, especially in a place like Queens? Is that something that you've thought about? Um, or, you know, I know this is just brand new project for you. So obviously, you know, you're still thinking things through, but being that we are in Queens, um, is this something that perhaps you may be thinking about? Or maybe this talk gives you this inspiration to think, you know, seek out and maybe try and see what these experiences look like for all the different nationalities living here in Queens. Um, it's a great question. Um, I actually have been working and collaborating with the Museum of the Chinese Culture and, in Manhattan. And we have been, uh, I've been going on uh, in Flushing Main Street again, this is before COVID, um, photographing, doing portraits of a lot of people of Chinese descent um, in that area of Flushing Main Street. And we're working on a, an exhibit coming up uh, about Chinese uh, people, Americans of Chinese descent. Wonderful, yeah, I think this is a really great topic to explore. So thank you, Anna, for bringing that up as well. And I think, you know, like I said, being um, in Queens, which is such a diverse uh, borough, I think it, it's just, it lends itself to, to, to documenting this, which is so important. Um, let me look through more comments. Um, there are some great comments where you can read through all of them later as well. Um, you know, everyone's saying, thank you for sharing your work. Um, a lot of people that have, you know, love the Mets photos through the years. There's so many memories there for many people. Um, they're definitely inspiring to see the, the, the photos. Um, Sheila uh, asks, how do you, um, how do you get, or what do you do maybe to get the emotion from people? Sheila, feel free to unmute yourself if, if I'm not saying the question correctly. Oh, um, how do you evoke yeah. emotion? <laughs> yeah, how do you evoke emotion from people? Yeah, sorry, that was a mis um, typo. Okay, yeah. um, thank you, Sheila, for asking that. Um, You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I have often had uh, my sister as my assistant when I go to spring training and I try to get the emotions out of people. And my sister just kind of shakes her head um, because I use humor a lot and, or I will like touch on something like say I see a tattoo on somebody's arm and I'll be like, oh, where did you get, you know, like try to uh, make a connection to the person that I'm photographing. And it could be just something very simple. Um, but um, I, I feel like, you know, and we could all do this, like pick up on somebody's like energy um, pretty quickly. And, and then if I see that they're not into like joking around, I stop immediately and then I get more serious. Like I was saying with the portrait of Mike Piazza when he was at his prime, he, he didn't have the time, he didn't have the interest to joke around. Um, but then later on when I photographed him a couple of years ago, he was having a ball. He, he was like a different person because he didn't have that, the weight on his shoulders. Um, so I think, um, uh, Sheila, it really depends on who I'm photographing. And um, I, I, I try to use humor. I try to use um, different, like, uh, you know, different techniques to get them to um, make certain experience. I, I was going to show a video tonight of me uh, making fun of baseball players but, that they aired on on like Facebook, which uh, I see some of my students laughing um, because I, they've seen it before um, where I'm just insulting people. I'm just literally insulting people like nice smile. Yeah. Can you do better? Mm -hmm. um, and, but that but that's just me. That's just the way it is um, because I want people to be relaxed. I don't want that hard pose photograph that I showed in the beginning beginning of them holding the baseball bat, I want it to be more relaxed. Thank That's you. nice. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. I have another. Uh, what digital camera, um, Christina asked, what digital camera would you recommend for someone starting digital photography? 
Um, for starting digital photography, honestly and truly, I do this. I go on consumer reports. I really do because um, I'm a Canon girl, but for the Mets, I had to shoot Nikon. So be I became a Nikon person because of that. But brands, you know, especially now uh, with the type of, um, like they don't matter as much anymore. I go by, I look at consumer reports. I'm, I'm such a like old fashioned mom, but I do look at consumer reports and I see what's highly rated. I read photogistic news, see what they rate as like uh, in an unbiased way. And then I make decisions uh, according to my price range, stay in your price range. That's the most important thing because oftentimes we over buy things and then and then it's you know you're not again photography should be fun this should be fun if you're worried about making payments or you're worried about other things then this is not fun anymore um it becomes more of a burden so i just say and also like a lot of the stuff that i shoot um, I, I, as I look around to find cameras, because I have a lot of cameras, I don't shoot with the expensive cameras. I don't because I, I all right. So I uh, see now, now look what you're making me do. Um, this semester in class, we're shooting with a Holga. A Holga is $40. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and this is what we're using and you get fantastic images with a $40 camera. So, so to me, money is not like, um, an expensive camera doesn't mean you're going to be a great photographer. Our, our, our $40 Holga is producing fantastic images. So it really, it really doesn't matter. Right. And I guess along those lines, uh, do you have a favorite film camera to use? Uh, Maritza is asking that question. <laughs> uh, um, my favorite film camera is my B. It's still my BB right here. It's still my Pentax 6.7. Um, I have now I... <laughs> I have two bodies, um, which is this part over here, and I have many, many lenses. It's still just as heavy and horrible to hold. Um, mm -hmm. But if you go on my website, um, I did a book, Incidental Heroes. I shot the whole thing on this camera, and I would go on the airplane with this camera. I would, I would pack like very, very few clothes and toiletries because I had to pack up my camera and film because that was priority. Um, so uh, that's my baby. Great. Um, let's see. I think there was one. Uh, uh, there was one that I'm trying to find. Uh, how, uh, Dimitri asks, how many shots do you take till you're completely satisfied? I guess that would depend maybe on... Uh, and whether it's an act, lab action game, right, or a portrait? <laughs> yeah, the, the portraits really weren't, th there weren't that many. Um, I probably would shoot um, maybe like five to 10 of each person. I really didn't shoot that many because I had such a short period of, of time. Um, but when I'm doing like this Italian series, we'll do different poses, we'll do different places. Um, but again, like um, when I showed the Bayside Milk Farm one, I couldn't get Pat to come out because he he was so involved with what he was doing. So I only got a couple of shots off before he ran back in. So it depends on on who you're photographing. Um, I, I, I will photograph all day long, you know, with, um, you know, with certain people, they allow that they have the time, other people don't have the time, you know, but but like uh, the series that I just did, um, when I asked uh, the woman Rose, if she wanted to go in the pool, she was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and she did, she put on her bathing suit and she went in the pool. But you know, it, it doesn't hurt to ask, like, why not ask? And people could say no. But you know what, sometimes people say yes. And then it's like, yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Yes. Who is someone? Justin? Did someone want to say something? Just unmuted. Oh, thanks, Dimitri. Dimitri. Can you hear <laughs> Thank me? you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. My question is: um, during the baseball games, um, to get like all like live action, right? And, like perfect timing. Say the perfect shots. Do you? keep your finger on the trigger and yeah look do you, you find your the whole time or you just just try to time it or like the right timing um that's a great question dimitri um yes my finger was always on the the shutter the the i was always pressing down 
And, um, and again, Dimitri, I'm shooting film. So film is, you only get 36 exposures on a roll of 35 millimeter. So you have to be like super careful. And, and also I didn't have, um, like I, I, like it was just very different, but I would keep my finger on there and the other hand would be on the focusing part. So I would, I would kind of have to use like two parts of my brain, which uh, Dimitri, you know, is not easy, um, but I would be pressing down and rotating the shutter at the, uh, rotating the lens at the same time. And again, like I, I said earlier, I'm shooting at 2.8, which means the lens is wide open and a very shallow depth of field. So it was like, Ooh, I'm lucky I got anything. <laughs> Shots came yeah. out perfectly, though. Thank you. Thank though. you, <laughs> thank you, Dimitri. I appreciate that. Yes. Um, I have a, a question uh, again I, from Sheila. Um, I guess very important when traveling. Do you usually put your uh, film camera um, in the film through the X-ray mis machine? Oh yeah, that's that's because I don't know if that's gonna damage the film and you know, in the camera and outside. I don't know. It's it, 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 years ago. I I had one of those like metal bags that we would throw our film in, and it was supposed to be like light proof. But what I found, Sheila, was that they just X rated extra to get through the metal bag and make sure it was film in the bag. So I have them um, hand check. I um. And I'll tell them I'm a photographer. I don't mind the camera going through the x-ray, but I would take the film and I would have a hand check and, and have them hand check it. And if they didn't, then I would be like, I need to speak to your supervisor. Then all of a sudden I would get all like gangsta, like, yeah, I need to speak, I, like, like, who am I? But I, I would just, I, I would fight so that it wouldn't go through the scanner because I have had film that goes through the scanner and then you just kind of see the echo of other images through it. And, and unless you want that, it, it really messes up the film. Oh, the other thing that I would do, like to go to spring training, I would Federal Express the film in a box so that when I got to the hotel, the film was already there. Oh, okay, so it does expose the film if you put it to the X-ray in the airport or any other. Yeah, you because... could just ask them to hand check it. And, hand check and, it, and they, okay. They, they'll hand check it. Oh, okay, and, okay. but if, if there is camera in the, in the film in the camera, then uh, you kind of have film in the camera, otherwise it's gonna drown the, yeah. Yeah, I, I normally wouldn't travel with film in the camera, but it, you know, if I needed to, then yeah, then you're just like, you know, whatever, whatever happens. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, thanks. Thank you. Sure. Great. Um, I think we, let's do one more question that I see here. Um, so Matthew asks, uh, will you be, or are you going to include your own family in the newest photograph series? Uh, <laughs> um, probably yes. Um, usually, again, like I mentioned, my sister is usually my assistant on a lot of these uh, photo shoots, my sister Angela. And um, so, uh, you know, yeah, my, my family has uh, been very, very supportive. And, and for me, asking them to model might be like one extra thing that they might say, yeah, I'm not doing that. Um, but, but who knows? Yeah, I might. I might do that. Right. Well, <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing where this photo project goes. I know, you know, it, it stopped for a little bit after COVID happened, but um, we certainly want to keep up with it and see where it goes and also on your other collaborations that you're doing. So um, I think you know, we, if we don't have any other questions, we'll um, end this part of the Q&A now. Uh, but I want to thank you, Gina, for thank being you. with us this evening, for sharing your stories, your, you know, your passion for photography, which you can really see, you know, shine through, even through the screen. Um, <laughs> so we are very happy um, to have you here today. And um, for everyone that made it uh, this evening, thank you so much. Um, we hope you enjoyed this artist talk with Dina. Um, you will be getting an email from us uh, with just a short survey that will ask you just about your experience with tonight's event. But again, I thank all of you for taking the time to be here with us this evening. Um, these programs, of course, we, we do them and we, we, we want people like you to be here today um, and experiencing this and as we all learn together. So 
thank you so much to all of you. Have a safe night. Um, and Gina, I'll include your information as well in, in, in the email that goes out to everyone so that in case anyone wants to follow Gina along, um, you can follow her on social media and as well um, check out her website. Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it's been thank wonderful. You. Be safe. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Staying. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Professor. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.